Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Hopefully it works now. We got it. Shout out to uh, Joseph Levels for the beat. Welcome. to Joseph Levels for that beautiful instrumental custom made just for me and I uh, always appreciate it brother thanks and he gave me that a long time ago um, so today guys uh, well first of all thanks for uh, tuning in um, <laughs> yeah, it's just nice to see all you guys out there um, was uh <laughs> J9, Travis, Frank, Amy, Alichi, Nappy, Millennials Best, Denise, Akhul Hood, Cortia, yeah, Robert Lawson, Cortia, Ipomea, Robert Jenkins, Reynolds Heavy Duty, yeah. <laughs> Rob Colbert, peace. Gracious lady, welcome. Welcome, welcome. So I'll do a little crash course. No worries. Denise McGuire, thanks for being here again. DJ Sepe, you already know. I hope I'm saying that right. TS. 
and welcome thanks for uh, tuning in thanks to all the moderators welcome thank you and uh i don't know if you guys noticed recently i was doing uh <laughs> i don't know i don't know why i was sleeping on the shorts but we're about to change the short game we're about to invade tiktok we got to get the kids and all the people that you know i included me i used to be like that I and mean, all of us a lot of us have trouble sitting through you know more than 10 minute videos you know like longer than 10 minutes what i mean so <laughs> you know my a lot of my videos are pretty long an hour two hours three hours four hours you know and they go they got many parts so you know these one minute hitters these one line hitters <laughs> these one line hitters we're getting a lot of new uh people you know the algorithms just throw them out there and uh you know people scrolling and i like what are you talking about what are you talking about man africa this egypt that you know all this other stuff so um, a lot of people ask me um, where I got this uh, video clip where the guy is saying, you know, Moses was lost because he was looking at the wrong place. The real promised land was uh, North and South America. North and South America. Yeah, Gunnar Thompson. They was like, hey, where you get that clip? Where you get that clip for? Well, all my old school followers, you guys know who that is. That's from my corn videos. My second series I ever made. You know, these are like talking about five years ago, six years ago. Uh, these videos and uh corn you know the reason i did corn and i thought it was so important is because corn proves that america is the true old world corn is native to the americas corn is found all over the old world so it wasn't introduced by columbus <laughs> aka sarco <laughs> sarco didn't bring it over there yeah salvador fernandez sarco that's real columbus that's his real name Columbus, uh, that's a uh, pseudonym. That's his corporation trademark. And that's the Christ bearer. He brought the Christ. You already know that. So, the mystery of the Egyptian Mai is such a mystery. Why is it a mystery? Because they found uh, maize corn all over the hieroglyphics. All over the hieroglyphics in Egypt, in China, in the Hindu temples being held by the deities. You guys already know all this. You know, uh, that was a great series. Man, I mean, we got fossilized corn over here. So old in, in Peru um, and Louisiana. Uh, they, man, we're talking about BC times. Uh, we were farming, agriculture, you know, uh, was created here in the Americas, agriculture. That's what helped, uh, you know, humans settle down from being just hunter gatherers or just being wandering around or not able to you know uh, stay in one place because once you got so much abundance then you're able to create cities you got time to create sports stadiums universities of canals highways and, you know that's what we did that's what we did we're not talking about just three little pyramids over there and so you know like we're not talking about a theme park geopolymer shout out to uh, paul cook shout out to paul cook proven he's over there and he <laughs> he's over there in uh uh theme park egypt you know, modern uh, theme park Egypt, um, proven that's all geopolymer. You know, I already know what he's thinking, uh, <laughs> seeing all that stuff over there. So, anyways, they're finding in those uh, theme park uh, hieroglyphics over there that are telling a story about ancient America. Of course, they're gonna find my east because they're telling the story of the real ancient Egypt, which is Tamari, Tamari, the beloved land, right? The beloved land. All right, real quick. <clears throat> so, I mean, simple uh, YouTube search, Kurimeo Egypt, you get a couple videos. All right. Uh, you know, <laughs> so check these out. All right. Researches into the lost histories of America. Atlantis, the pre Egyptians are Atlanteans. Uh oh. Ancient Nagas founded Egypt. Negro Buddha, the two Ethiopians, the Black Asians, and Acalypsis, what's the saying there? Predecessors of the ancient Egyptians from South America, hidden archaeology, the Crespi Collection, come on, the Maya colonists, founders of ancient Egyptian, Hindu, and Chaldean cultures and mythology, untold ancient American truth, part 11, come on. Ancient so-called Egyptians historically were in the Americas. All right, that's a great video I did recently, about two months ago, it's just a little compilation. Of a lot of the old videos and uh, Stern's Garden Egypt, 
and uh, and so on and so on. Ancient Egyptian maize, the first civilization in the world in America, Atlantis, Tamari, corn. We've gone over corn a lot. But uh, today we're going to uh, basically show the full documentary uh, <laughs> that um, Gunnar Thompson made regarding what he found and his findings of ancient maize, how it traveled the whole world. And just we're going to hear what he has to say about certain things. Very uh, wise person. Much love and respect to Gunnar Thompson. Rest in power. Rest in peace. Right, He did great research while he was here. And uh, much love to his family and everything. Uh, this is for fair use commentary and education all right so basically if you're new to my channel um <sighs> america's a true old world you know we've uh, shown it cor corroboration and we've proven it in so many ways uh, shout out to all the researchers out there in the different channels you know and i'm not the only one so much uh, information going on now and so many distractions too going on right now there's real things happening in the world you know a lot of things most of these things are orchestrated there's a there's a movie playing out in the news just hope for the best and uh, pray to uh, Hawaii to protect the innocent and to protect us because you know eventually we got to face uh, <laughs> also the problem they create so you know Eventually, we got to get in the matrix and plug in and be part of the movie. So, you know, let's just be ready and let's keep let's keep staying informed, you know. So the mystery of Egyptian mice, because we're talking about old world, we're talking about true promised lands, right? True promised lands. Well, people are in conflict and duplicated in phantom promised lands. I'm just going to be real with you, but um, still. Hawa protect the innocent and, and his people, man. Hawa protect his people, those who keep the code. Keep the code. And um, so let's get on to the uh, documentary. Shout out to Gunnar Thompson again. Let's go and see, get the music going. Welcome to the program on Egyptian Maze. I'm Gunnar Thompson. I will be your host and your guide as we follow a track of clues all across the world trying to solve the mystery of Egyptian Maze. But first, I'd like to start with a little humor. At the first Atlantic Conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia last year, there was a joke going around uh, about Prince Henry Sinclair. Uh, Prince Henry Sinclair was the Earl of the Orkneys, which are located north of uh, the British Isles. Well, one day, Prince Henry Sinclair, and this was back in the 14th century, he, he said to his followers, let's make a little bit of money by establishing a colony across the seas. And in order to do that, they had to find new lands. So Prince Henry bought a ship, and he loaded it up with cargo and hired a crew, and they set off across the Atlantic Ocean. Well, they hadn't gone very far before the lookout, lookout called down from the crow's nest, and he said, Your Lordship, there's trouble on the horizon. And Prince Henry shouted back up, Well, what is the trouble? And the lookout shouted back down, There's ships and sails. There's three of them. And Prince Henry shouted back, Can you identify any of those ships? And the lookout shouted back, Yes, the first one's the Pinta, the second one's the Nina and the third one's the Santa Maria. And his lordship shouted back up, can you identify any flags on those ships? And the lookout shouted back down, yes, they're all flying the flag of Spain. And at that moment, the lieutenant rushed up to Prince Henry and declared, oh my goodness, we're in trouble. There's a race to find new lands. Prince Henry very solemnly put his hand on his lieutenant's shoulder and said, Donna ye worry me lad, those ships aren't looking for new lands, they're heading for China. Well, of course, 
Columbus was lost. He thought he was going to China, and that's because the wrong name for the land across the sea was on the map that he had. Yes, Columbus had a map. But even so, he was lost. And that brings up the issue of the person who holds the record for being lost. That was an individual by the name of Moses. All right, so before he starts talking about Moshe, <laughs> so, you know, we got Dr. Hijack again. You know, I know he's talking. Let's not get lost in the, uh, you know, in the, <laughs> in the misconceptions and confusion, right? Uh, Columbus was never lost. Sarko, Salvador Fernandez Sarko was never lost. All right. Yeah. North America was India superior. In so-called Columbus time, the place we call India today was called Hindustan. And before that, it was called Bharat. Bharat. It wasn't called India. And actually, in medieval times, there was a the reference to the three Indias. Shout out to uh, 432 The Drop Radio. You know, and the, the realms and the lands of Prester John. See, Pangu, you already know. So, you know, uh, we're kind of looking at it in reverse a lot of the times. You know, we keep saying people came from Europe, people came from Asia, people came from Africa, people came from... There was nobody in America ever. You know, a whole continent empty or just one kind of people. You know, that's that's all been debunked. We've proven that like we've shown this people been here since creation this is the oldest land out of the water proven by geology geology the most famous geologist already told you the true old world america first out of the waters mayak from the bosom the maya people that's what it, you know from the bosom and you know from here spread out all right so that was a very interesting story even though uh, mr thompson you know um, but uh, he's going to talk about Moshe being lost, right? <laughs> we got to dodge the hijack on that, too. So, again, be ready to dodge the hijack. You know, it's like it's like, um, it's like when uh, you're boxing and uh, you got a punch coming, you got to dodge it. Like, boom. Like, for real, you got to really dodge it. Like the Matrix. You know? <sighs> like the Matrix. Dodge the hijack. Because <laughs> it's coming. But he's going to tell you some major drop right now all right this is what people were talking to me where i got this clip from and um he's gonna tell you what what scholars started realizing in the 18th century which is the 1700s let's go well the bible says that moses wandered about in the sinai desert for 40 years uh, the big problem was that the tribes of Israel were also following around behind Moses. And that means everybody was lost for about 40 years. Well, the Sinai Desert just is not all that big. If you've got a good supply of water and a decent camel, you should be able to cross it in about a month. But they wandered around for 40 years. And some of my women friends tell me that that just goes to show, even back in biblical times, men didn't like to stop and ask directions. <laughs> so Moses was lost, Columbus was lost. They were both fundamentalists, and they were following what they believed was what they should be doing. It was written down in stone, the laws, and Moses was looking for the promised land. Well, perhaps he was looking in the wrong place. Perhaps the promised land was as many historians in the 18th century finally realized the promised land was North and South America. Friends tell me that that just goes to times men didn't like to stop and ask directions. So Moses was lost, Columbus was lost. So do you guys hear what he just said? Because the promised land was in North and South America. Shout out to Gunnar Thompson. Moses was looking for the promised land. Well, perhaps he was looking in the wrong place. Perhaps the promised land was, as many historians in the 18th century finally realized, the promised land was North and South America. Uh-huh. This here is the Alberton Diver And you notice how he looked down, right? Now he's going to talk about this map behind him, the Iberton. Here we go. A map. It's a map that uh, I found back in 1995. I brought it out of hiding and I, I introduced it to the scientific community. Now, the important thing about this map, it, it was made by Alberton de Verga, who was a Venetian, in 1414, and it's a secret commercial map. But it shows up here, this is 
north of the British Isles, here's the British Isles, Spain, Norway, Africa, Mediterranean, Italy. North of the British Isles, we have this orange or red continent, and it sticks out from Norway. Well, there were many names for this ancient continent. The Norwegians called it Norveka, or Dusky Norway. The Irish called it Hibernia Major, or Great Ireland. And the Scots called it Estoteland, or New Scotland. All right, so Grice, Nuremberga, that's America. We, we can prove that easily. All the old maps, Nuremberga's all over. We can prove that. Estoteland, Greater Ireland, I got a video coming. I'm going to show you guys where Greater Ireland was. The ancient annals, even the ancient people of Ireland used to talk about Greater Ireland. And that was over here. All right. And he's going to tell you that's what it is. This is interesting to me right north and west of the British Isles. Because in Europe during the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, the merchants from across the seas from this land area that appears on this map, they were bringing maize and turkeys across the ocean, across the Atlantic Ocean. And these were bring, being introduced into Northern Europe. Well, there's a number of names that the Northern Europeans had for maize. One was turkey corn, and that's because the corn was fed to turkeys. Another name was Welsh corn, and that's because merchants from Wales were bringing the corn across the Atlantic. And another term was Indian corn, and that's because many people thought that it was India that was located across the sea. So we find similar... So, again, many people thought it was India that was across the sea. Why would people think that in ancient times? When these people were navigating, they know where they were going. And I also want to emphasize they were also calling it Turkish weed. Like wheat, you know, they were calling corn Turkish weed in Europe and Asia. That's in my corn videos. We've proved it. They were actually talking about corn, the reason Turkish, not only because of the turkeys, but it was because it was being brought through Asia from Turkey, I mean, to Europe from Turkey, you know, from Asia. Corn had gone around from Asia, from America, and ended up with the Muslims, the Turks. They were the ones, the merchants controlling the trade there. Uh, anything that went from Asia to Europe, so they were the ones usually with the corn. Turkish wheat, they called it, Turkish wheat. names for turkeys and corn, Indian corn, Welsh corn, turkey corn, turkeys, Welsh hens, and dindons, or Indian hens, and names for turkeys. Uh, and this is because the merchants were carrying these animals across the sea. Now, this is All right, so <laughs> you got to understand, turkeys are from America, right? Corn is from America, like the turkeys he's talking about, you guys are going to see. People had this before Columbus and Europe. That's what he's telling you. This is this can be proven. This is really intriguing to me because the mystery of Egyptian maize got its start in Scotland when a number of my colleagues, uh, time detectives, noticed that there were carvings of the maize plant or Indian corn inside Rosslyn Chapel. And Rosslyn Chapel is no, is located right in the vicinity of Edinburgh, Scotland. In 2006, I got messages from two friends who urged me to see the evidence of corn in Rosslyn Chapel in Edinburgh. Yep. Here's an aerial view of the exterior of the chapel uh, from a tourist brochure. Here's the stone vault inside the chapel. The red arrow is on a corn cob that has been carved into a stone vault. The corn cob is identified by a conical shape and parallel rows of beads or kernels arranged along the surface. This is a comparison of the Mayan corn god with Rosslyn corn. In both cases, there are rows of corn beads on the leaves. This shows a similar treatment of the artistic design. During the 16th century, and probably much earlier, Germans called maize by the name of Welsh corn. According to Welsh legends, a prince by the name of Madoc established a colony in the New World during the 11th century. Probably Welsh merchants sailing between the colony and Europe brought back corn to northern European ports. And that seems like a plausible explanation for why the Germans referred to maize as Welsh corn. Here's an illustration of turkey corn from Fuchs Herbal of 1542. Early corn in Europe was called Indian corn or turkey corn. One reason it was called turkey corn is because it was imported to feed turkeys. Turkeys were New World farm birds that were known to the Romans and the Turks. 
Here is a wo woven image of a turkey farm in Sweden during the 10th century. This mm. is from a tapestry in the Stockholm Museum. These right. are turkeys. They're New World birds. New World turkeys, okay? American turkeys in Sweden in the 10th century. He's saying 10th century, 900s? <laughs> so we're talking about, remember the chronologies, how it's been split in three ways. All right, put everything in reference. Yeah. Here we have two turkeys on the Bayeux Tapestry from France, and the tapestry was made in around the year 1070, or slightly after the Norman invasion of England. Once again, we have turkeys indicated, and the French often referred to the turkeys as dindons, or birds of India. This is a schematic representation of the Bayeux. So turkeys, yeah, most of them are native to the Americas. A lot of animals are actually native to the Americas, like I've been trying to say. America's the true old world when we're talking about true eating and all that. You know, so as he's as he's saying, they used to reference these circuit as Indian turkeys, but India wasn't they were referring to it coming from, you know, the West, you know, coming from the West, you know, not from, you know, the other India. So turkeys and a modern turkey, as you can see, they are pretty much the same. The food historian Magalome Toussaint Somat mentioned that turkeys were served at the 13th century banquet given for Philip of Burgundy. Here is a German turkey on a mural from the Schleswig Cathedral, circa 1280. One name for turkeys in Germany was the Welsh hen. So we have both names, Welsh corn and Welsh hen, arriving in Germany. This suggests that merchants from a Welsh colony in the New World were importing turkeys and turkey feed at the same time. It was a way for merchants to make money. All right. So we're going to go to part two. Yeah, definitely Turkish corn or Turkish wheat is what they were calling it, uh, you know. Several volunteers of the Time Detectives scoured the collections of museums in London, Berlin, Paris, Rome, New York, Chicago, Cairo, and San Francisco. One of the challenges confronting Time Detectives is that Egyptian artifacts have been sold, stolen, or given away to many private collections and museums. In other words, the clues to the mystery of the Egyptian maze are spread out all over the world. We found lots of evidence of corn cobs and corn plants in the Egyptian tombs and temples. This comes as quite a surprise, considering that all the authorities, all the tenure professors, and all the encyclopedias claim that there is no evidence of Egyptian maize. Here is an example of an artifact that is decorated with corn plants at the Cairo Museum. It is from the, the Nakwada I phase of archaeology. That means that the artifact dates to about 4000 BC. That's from the earliest phase of farming along the Nile River. In other words, the corn was already there when the ancient Egyptians first started farming. Here is a comparison of a Hopi Indian maize decoration with the Egyptian corn plant in the middle. The pattern of drooping leaves terminating with corn tassels at the very top are very similar to the modern corn plant. Here is a schematic drawing of a tomb mural from the Cairo Museum. The mural dates to about 2000 BC. The corn plant is with a food offering display on the right hand side of the mural. Here we see an enlargement of the mural from Amenhemhet's tomb, and the corn plant is identifiable from the yellow corn cob and the green husk leaves. Many of the Old Kingdom murals were not very well uh, carved or painted, and one Egyptian authority, Helen Strudwick, calls this Old Kingdom example lettuce. Another variety of maize is shown in this example from a tomb on the Giza Plateau near Cairo. Typically the maize ears are shown on platters or on food displays along with breads, jars of beer, and butchered animals. Here's an example of a tombstone with a corn cob. There was an association of maize with the Osiris cult of resurrection. Tens of thousands of these stone monuments were made in Egypt. The British Museum has over a hundred stored away in a warehouse. This is an illustration from a papyrus book called the Book of the Dead. It comes from a scroll in the British Museum dating to about 1200 BC. These examples are from the British Museum. On the left are Sumerian hieroglyphs for corn and a generic glyph for grain that is in the shape of a corn plant or a bush. On the right hand side is a glass jug with a corn plant which served as a decoration. Here is a comparison of a Sumerian glyph for grain and a modern corn plant. The Sumerian grain symbol dates to a period between 4000 and 5000 BC. 
So it would appear that corn or maize was present in the Middle East right about at the time that huge city-states started forming up along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. So literally the hieroglyph for grain <laughs> is, is literally looks like maize uh, in ancient Babylon. So um, what I wanted to emphasize is that my corn videos, we kind of broke down that a lot of times they say, well, corn just means grain, Kurimeo. They're not talking about real corn. We actually debunked that. <laughs> we actually really debunked that. Um, and maize is a grain. So when you when you say it's another type of grain they're talking about, you're adding conjecture. Why do you have to, why are you picking another grain? You know, they're, just, no, they're not being specific what type of grain. But what type of grain can you usually eat right from the plant, milky? All right. Just like it says in scripture in the Bible that they went and grabbed the, you know, corn right from the plant and started eating it. All right. We already know you can't do that with weed and any other grains. They're too hard. So. This was very near the dawn of Western civilization. A period called the New Kingdom starts in about 1500 BC in Egypt. It is at the beginning of this period that corn cobs have their greatest level of realism. This example is from the tomb of Nakhet, circa 1424 BC. There is a corn cob with very distinctive kernels. There can be no question that this plant was intended to represent Indian corn. Here's another example of corn cobs from the tomb of Seti I, dated to about 1292 BC. In about 1500 BC, Egyptian methods of agriculture and food preparation spread to Mexico. Here we see a comparison of women in Egypt and Mexico using the same kind of equipment to grind corn. One name for the corn dough in Egypt was masa, and the same word was used by Mexican women for corn dough used to make tortillas. The Egyptian word masa, or mas, is probably the root for later words of mace or maize. You guys, uh, so in my corn videos, we broke that down. Uh, thanks to Gunnar uh, Thompson's investigation. Uh, he's lit. I don't know if you guys heard Masa and Masa both in both in ancient Egypt and Mesoamerica for us still in speaking Spanish countries we call Masa you know that's 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 corn and and that's the matzah or flattened bread that matzah <laughs> the so-called Jewish matzah 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 the flattened bread tortillas we're just talking about tortillas you know unleavened bread so um uh, Dr. Hijack here with this image. He's talking about 900 AD and 2000 BC. Ancient Egypt again was here. And we know the Maya and ancient people had all this uh, stuff. We got all so many of these metates in Costa Rica and they're from BC times. And I've showed them in my, um, when I went to the museum, check out the video when I went to the museum, I'm showing the statues and, and, the, and the metates for the corn as you see here. In ancient times, BC, so that's what I was saying, Dr. Hijack. You know, again, they try to always glorify other places, the phantoms and duplicates. I have identified Pharaoh Hatshepsut as the Queen of Maize. It is during the reign of this woman Pharaoh that the most realistic illustrations of Indian corn crop up in Egyptian tombs. The Queen's Maize is found at her temple museum at Deir el Bari. This huge temple is located in the Upper Nile region across from Luxor and Thebes. Here's an Shout out to uh, Paul Cook. He went over there to the Valley of the, the Kings or whatever, where they have the, uh, you know, the burials and stuff. And uh, he's <laughs> he's showing you, it's all geopolymer. A lot of debris built up. They just threw a lot of debris and made it look like debris and build up. He's there looking at it, guys. Like he's, you know, go check out the videos. You see what I mean? example of a mural from Hatshepsut's temple. This reconstruction is by Howard Carter in 1909. It appeared in an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City in 12205. Uh, 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 the museum is known simply as the Met. It was also published in a book about the exhibit by Catherine Rory. Oddly enough, nobody at the Met seems to have noticed that the New World Corn was part of the Hatshepsut special exhibit. Here's an enlargement of the maze in Hatshepsut's temple. This illustration shows the corn cobs that decorate a single room in Hatshepsut's temple. So a lot of people might be like, well, this don't look like corn to me, corn. Well, this is when you uh, unwrap the corn, uh, you know, the ear, the corn ear, you unwrap it. And so you got the leaves in the back hanging. 
that's that's literally what it is. There's a lot of uh, drawings like this in, uh, in the hieroglyphics in ancient Egypt, so-called over there, in the theme park. Yeah, it's telling a story about ancient America to Mary. The room is called the Anubis Chapel. There are over 30 corn cobs intermingled with the fruits, spreads, and jars in the offering displays. This is an illustration from the Queen's Temple. It shows the kind of vessel that members of the Punt expedition used to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. It would appear that the temple was intended to promote overseas commerce. An Egyptian text from the reign of Pharaoh Ramses III refers to an overseas region called the Inverted Waters. This is a reference to a place on the earth where lands and seas are upside down with respect to Egypt. In other words, it is evident that at least some of the intellectual leaders in ancient Egypt understood the, spher the spherical shape of the world. This is an Olmec colossal head from San Lorenzo, Mexico. It is dated to a period from 1400 to 900 BC. Obviously, the stone carving has the facial features of a black African. Obviously. <laughs> hey, listen, hey, hey, you know, rest in peace, you know, but, you know, um, <laughs> African is not a phenotype, okay? Do you guys know there's many phenotypes in Africa? Okay. One thing, right? Uh, so, yeah, he means it looks like a so-called Negro to him. Yeah. Just like I did my short the other day. Uh, actually, today. I just dropped it earlier before this. The physiognomy of the Indian is unbeatably, uncharacteristically of that of the Negro. So that's, again, you know, the so-called Negro has many looks. It's not just one phenotype either. You know, so that's that's... But yeah, this is what they want to do, use as a uh, prototype. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so he wants to make it African. And that's what everybody else does. So we've been growing up and everybody's been like, look, that's an African. Okay, show me when they came, the so-called African. I got a video for you guys. I got a whole series coming probably. I don't know if it's one video, a couple about, it's going to be called the Out of All McTheory. Got a lot of good information on them. I've been trying to see how I do this video, how I explain this. And so we're going to break, try to break it down. At least just uh, read some information on that mother culture of Mesoamerica, what they are calling so-called Olmec. All right. So again, you know, dodge your own hijacks. Uh, if, if you look at this and you say, well, that's an African for sure, then you do not understand true history. And you got to uh, get rid of the stereotypes and the misconceptions that you're uh, holding in your mind. <laughs> Here's a black and white comparison of the Olmec head with a schematic image of a modern day resident of Ghana, Africa. Note the close similarity. This is not So, I mean, I can find people that look like that from here and uh, <laughs> it's just, this is, uh, you know, all right, let's just keep going and uh, yeah. Not a coincidence of abstract art. The distinctive lip ridge is a genetic trait that rules out any possibility that it resulted from an abstraction. The pronounced lip ridge is a characteristic of artwork in 15th century BC, Egypt, and Mexico. Here is a comparison of lip ridges from three Olmec statues with a contemporary Egyptian sculpture. This is the imposing exterior of the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. This is one of many libraries where time detectives searched for published sources on Egyptian maze. We had documented 124 corn cobs in Egyptian tombs, temples, and scrolls <coughs> by August of 2008. A preliminary report in this study was presented to the first Atlantic Conference on August the 16th. By October of last year, my associates and I had documented 425 corn cobs in ancient Egyptian art. Even you can become an instant authority on Egyptian maize simply by examining art books at your local library or at your secondhand bookstore. Here is a summary table of what we found. Note that during the last phase of Egyptian history, the post-dynastic period at the bottom, the corn cobs had become so stylized that they didn't look anything at all like Indian corn. The Greek god of the underworld was Hades. He is seen here on an image that was taken from a Greek vase. The symbol was a huge cow horn that was filled with grains and fruits. It was called a cornucopia, or horn of plenty. The name for a horn, cornu, was probably the source for the word we use to represent maize. That is, cornu was changed to simply corn. The corn cob was called corn or cornu because it had the shape of a cow's horn. 
Here is a Minoan merchant and an ocean-going ship circa 1500 BC. This map shows the principal routes that Bronze Age traders used to transport native copper from out of the Great Lakes region. They also brought corn from the same area. Copper traders brought ingots across the North Atlantic to the British Isles, Spain, the Mediterranean, and on to the Middle East. These are a pair of Cretan corncob rings that were cast from gold in about 2000 BC. They are evidence of the great wealth that was obtained from the corn trade. Corn was the principal food of the lower classes, the merchants, travelers, laborers, slaves, and soldiers. These were the very people upon whose bare backs civilization arose from the earth. Native Americans carved the faces of Mediterranean sailors in clay and stone. These illustrations compare the faces of old world travelers with the corresponding Native American artifacts that have been found in archaeological sites in Mexico, Guatemala, and Peru. These represent just a few of the hundreds of artifacts that the ancient travelers left behind in the Americas. Men wearing fish costumes represent ocean travelers from beneath the seas. They were called mermen or seamen. One merchant on the left carries a corn pod and a seed bag. These symbols reveal the role of merchants in dispersing maize all across the world between 5000 and 1000 BC. The earliest destination for New World copper and corn was the Middle East. Here we see a genie holding a corn cob. This Assyrian artifact dates to about 900 BC. Most doctrinaire scholars identify the seed pod as a pine cone. However, the artistic and agricultural context of the Assyrian civilization suggests that the genie is actually holding a cob of maize. All right, so the guy with the watch, all right, the guy with the watch holding the corn. They've been telling us acorn. They've been telling us, oh, it's the pineal gland. It's metaphor. It's, it's, not, it's not physically, it's a, a me metaphor. Oh, yeah, it's not always that deep. Sometimes it's very simple, guys. It's corn. It's corn, all right? And you got to dodge the hijack. They've been teaching us all this in reverse. Again, they show these phenotypes in the stone. I was talking early. I was muted. Sorry, guys. And um, I wanted to say they show all those phenotypes. We had all those phenotypes here. He's saying these old world, the Indians carved these old world faces. Why wouldn't they carve themselves? Why are they covering other people? <laughs> So again, America's a true old world. This is corn they're holding. All right, the eagle bird man. Yeah, the eagle face man, he got it. Who's the eagle face man? Well, we had eagle face warriors here. We got eagle warriors. We dress like eagles here. I, they found that in the mounds in the Mississippi, the bird man. So what are you talking about? Here's another example. Here's another one. My associate, Mark, McInerney says that the Assyrians were famous for growing huge supplies of grain, not for planting pine trees. Indeed, most of the items that we see in the hands of genies look more like corn cobs than they do pine cones. So I'm going to show you guys some corn that looks just like this. We got a lot of varieties of corn. A lot of the ancient corn actually looked like this as it was being transformed from the Teosintle, the Teosintle wild plant. You guys know that's where the corn comes from. It was genetically modified from that by our ancestors. They call it Teosintle because Teo meant God. And Sintle is corn or plant, or plant of the gods. Okay? The grain of the gods. The grain of the gods, all right? Grain. Teosintle. Here is a sample of corn cobs from ancient India, Mexico, Peru, and modern America and they have a similar appearance to the Assyrian corn cobs. This illustration is from a Babylonian stone tablet. It shows two riders on horseback moving alongside parallel corn rows. The height of corn is exactly the same that the Spaniards reported in Peru, and this artifact dates to about 1000 BC. Here is a comparison of the native Peruvian and Babylonian corn rows. 
The genie on the left is from a stone slab in the British Museum. The Birdman on the right was sold at Sotheby's Auction House in London. So right here, basically what I want to remind you, which we went over in my corn videos, and we read a lot in my corn videos, uh, there was an ancient type of corn uh, in America, right, that um, had one corn cob in the top, just like this. It was very tall, and it had one corn cob in the top. That was a variety of corn, and later on it was, you know, modified to produce corn, more uh, more ears of corn, you know, on the sides and everything, not just on the top. But this was a type of corn. They date to a period from about 700 to 900 BC. In the middle is an example of the corn plant from another Babylonian tablet. Notice they are all very similar. Here is an example of the Babylonian tree of life. It is a tree of corn cobs. Each branch terminates in an ear of maize. Here is another tablet from Babylon, and it shows a farm scene featuring a corn row and a litter of pigs. Here is a colored image of the Babylonian corn row. This is a cylinder seal showing a man with two corn plants. The artifact is at the Louvre Museum in Paris. It was found at the archaeological site of Iraq in Iraq. The artifact dates to about 3000 BC. This is the Warka vase from the Baghdad Museum. It dates to about 3300 BC. We see along the lower register a row of corn plants with irrigation ditches running between them. The plant can be identified as maize because of the huge size of cobs, the waffle pattern on the cobs, and the very large leaves and stalks. This is Stonehenge. It is located about 150 miles southwest of London. The Bronze Age structure dates to the same span of time that merchants were bringing copper to the British Isles. The first stones were laid in about 3000 BC, or right about at the dawn of Egyptian civilization. This is the Hecatius map of about 500 BC. It is one of several maps that predate the Phoenician cartography of Marinus and the Roman cartography of Ptolemy. This map has the Gulf of Mexico labeled as the Caspian Sea. A team of Greek explorers in about 500 BC issued a report affirming that this was true. So a lot of these uh, ancient maps where it shows the, only the three continents, that's what they tell us. They actually, a lot of scholars say that that part right there, this is not a good one, but there's better ones which show, you know, the, the Caspian Sea as being the Gulf of Mexico. You know, that's the Florida over there sticking out. The South America was labeled India. They're just combining it differently. So, you know, that's the research we've shown actually in certain videos. This is Aristosthenes map of about 300 BC. It has a southern continent indicated as the Altar Orbis, meaning the other world. This is an early name for South America, and it's the same name that Columbus used for South America. This is a Roman map by Macrobius, circa 440 AD. So this is a good one by Macrobius. Uh, it actually shows India, where my arrow is. I don't know if you guys can see it, but my next to where that red arrow is pointing, that's Florida. That's the Gulf of Mexico, and that's South America right there, Central America, and then they got India <laughs> attached to it right, right next to it. You know, so-called India right here. So, you know, I see how it goes into Asia. So when you go, when you're talking about the farthest east, the farthest east, right, that was where Marco Polo went when he went to go see the Grand Khan, the Prester, King David, King Dawid, Khan Dawid, Priest King, yeah he went to the farthest east if you keep going east from asia where you do you guys end up come on they still haven't found the lands of marco polo you guys know that right they don't know where he went so they try to say it's more like a myth like a tale but it's historic they know it it is presently at the huntington library in san marino california the map is a very accurate florida and gulf of mexico Florida was a Roman goddess of springtime. This is an enlargement of the Macrobius map showing the Florida Peninsula and the Gulf of Mexico. The Portuguese had a map of the same area called Antilia, or the Antilles, in 1436. So why? Did so you see where they got Western India, India. <laughs> so so it's, it's you know the true India. Remember, modern India they didn't get named that until the 1900s. You guys know that 1900s. That's when they got named. Columbus get credit for discovering lands that were already known to the Romans and the Portuguese? Let's go to Rome. Time detectives in Italy were asked to find evidence of Egyptian corn during the era of the Roman Empire. It was said that Egypt was, quote, the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. 
So it stands to reason that if there was maize in Egypt, then we might expect to find evidence of that grain growing in the artifacts uh, of ancient Italy. And this is a section of the Palestrina mural. It shows an alligator and a hippopotamus in a marshy area. The Villa Palestrina is located southeast of Rome, and this mural is dated to the first century AD. Names for maize in Rome included Roman corn, polenta, and pulse. The words polenta and pulse are both derivatives from the words used for a pole mill. The pole was used to crush the corn into mush prior to baking it as an ash cake or a griddle cake. Most of the maize in Rome was imported in grain bags or gunny sacks from Egypt, Tunisia, and Turkey. The upper class regarded the pulse or cornmeal uh, as barbaric. They preferred the finer pastries that bakers made from wheat, leavening, butter, and honey. Thus, we don't see very many corn plants shown in Roman art. Wheat is a small grain that grows in short plants that are about waist high. Fibers sticking out from the seeds along the sides are referred to as the beard. Roman coins feature images of wheat and barley. Note the beard fibers that typically stick out from the sides. An ivory carving at the Archbishop's Palace at Ravenna, near Rome, includes this scene from the biblical story of Joseph and the starving Jews. The carving is dated to the 5th century AD. We see the grain having the shape of corn cobs in the husk. A photograph of a corn cob in the husk is shown on the right. Obviously the grain in this 5th century Roman carving is not wheat. It is equally evident that the artist knew that seed corn or maize was stored in the husk. A fertility statue from Tunis appears to be holding an ear of corn, although some writers have identified this as an ear of wheat. It would seem far too large for wheat. Also, the waffle pattern on the cob was typically used to represent corn, as were the hairs on the top of the cob. Mm -hmm. This is an advertising sign from a bakery near Rome. It dates to the first century. A so corn plant accompanies the menu item for polenta. It's all corn. An enlargement of the baker's sign is compared to modern maize, so we can confirm that Romans ate cornmeal. So-called Romans. What is, to, what is a so-called Roman? Who are the Etruscans? Who's the Edomians, Edomites? All right. Oh, we're going to part four. One afternoon, I was sitting with friends at, at a Madison pub called Hawks Bar and Grill. Gary Max, uh, who is an outstanding author, asked me, how do you know it's really maize? Now, that's truly an important question. So I asked my associates to explore the problem, and we agreed to meet up in September of 2008 at Science Hall on the University of Wisconsin campus. Here's one open-minded thinker who managed to teach for 20 years at Harvard University. His name is Paul Mangelsdorf. Back in the 1950s, Paul proposed the radical idea that modern corn plants had evolved from a wild maize ancestor. He called this ancestor pod corn. Here's a comparison of Mangled, Mangelsdorf's theoretical pod corn with a modern maize plant. The big difference is that the pod corn has the ear of corn at the very top. Note the red arrow. In modern maize, the corn cobs are all situated along the sides and toward the bottom of the plant. You might recall that the corn plants we saw from Babylon and Rome also had the corn cobs at the very top. The oldest Native American artwork showing maize is from Peru. This artifact is dated to about 1000 BC. Note that the maize ears are all situated along the sides of the plants. So the American botanists and archaeologists assumed that this was the way that the earliest cultivated corn should look. The earliest maize cobs that archaeologists have found in America come from southwest Mexico. They date to a period between 3000 and 1000 BC. An example is on my, in my hand on the left. It's about an inch or two high. This tiny plant is what American scholars have assumed was the standard size of maize cobs at that point in time. I have compared this Mexican maize to the corn cob that we've already examined from Hatshepsut's temple in Egypt. These are contemporaneous in age. Note that the Egyptian maize here is, full, is fully developed. It measures about 7 to 11 inches high, or about the same size as your typical modern supermarket corn cob. Here's my new model for the evolution and the natural selection process that led to the modern maize plant. This is derived partially from the pioneering research of Paul Mangelsdorf. The broad leaves of the plant look a lot like those of marsh reeds. In particular, they are similar to a plant called cord reed. After the last ice age, about 15 to 20,000 BC, the climate of North America began to grow warmer. There were lots of cool water marshes extending from the region of Florida all the way up to the Great Lakes and along the Mississippi River. Plants in the corn family adapted to changing microclimates over a period of several thousand years. That is to say, nature, and not native horticulturalists, developed most of the varieties of maize. 
Some varieties grew in temperate valleys, others grew in cool river marshes, and some grew in warm deltas. A few top co cob maize plants still exist in Oaxaca State in Mexico and in Guatemala. Everywhere else, they have been replaced by the modern hybrid corns with the cobs along the sides. Damn, that's my fault, guys. I was uh, muted. I was just showing you how um, <laughs> the top cop right here in ancient Egypt, and on the top it has the wheat, very different. It's using the cow. That's what you need for corn. You got to plant it deep, literally, literally depicting corn in this hieroglyphic. All right, that's top cop, top cop. One variety of the ancestral corn plant adapted itself to hot, dry climates and to high altitudes where moisture is scarce. This is the modern form of wild corn called teosinte, or admired wild corn grass called teosinte. The plant is frail and skinny like most hot climate grasses. The seeds of this plant are inedible, but it is, it is still a genetic relative of the corn family. One way that we know the Egyptians and Babylonians had maize is the location of the seed pot at the very top of the plant. Here are some examples from Babylon, all around 3000 BC. Here are Babylonian corn plants from marshy or delta environments. The artworks date to about 1000 BC. Here's an Egyptian harvesting top cob corn plants on the right. The corn has two characteristic features. One, the top cobs with hairs at the top. And two, corn or maize is typically shoulder height or higher, whereas wheat on the left is typically waist height uh, to shoulder height. Here's an example of top cob maize in China from a 16th century herbal. Here's a Roanoke, Roanoke Indian corn plant from the coast of Virginia in 1586. Francis Drake had his naturalist draw the picture when he rescued the colonists of Roanoke who had been abandoned by their landlord. My associate Mark McInerney sketched these two top cob maize plants during an expedition he took to Mexico and Guatemala. This is the heirloom variety of maize. These plants are quickly becoming extinct because they do not produce as large a per acre yield of grain as do the hybrid modern corns. Here we see the same type of corn plant in a Mexican folk art painting. The Bubastus treasure hoard in Egypt has provided further clues. Here we see a golden drinking flask on the left. The relief carved surface is identical to that of the golden sweet variety of maize. Another New World plant Crookneck squash is also seen along with maize in most of the ancient Egyptian tomb paintings. There are two kinds of large production field farming in medieval Europe, wheat farming and maize farming. This is an uh, 15th century French uh, drawing. The English farmer Jethro Tull invented the mechanical corn drill in 1700. Babylonians had a hand-operated corn drill circa 700 BC. Large seeds were dropped into the funnel or hopper, and these were fed by a tube directly into the furrow. So keep in mind that the corn drill and the plow were used primarily for deep seed planting of large seeds. This is not an appropriate method for 
planting wheat. Wheat is planted in what is called the broadcast fashion. This illustration shows two more versions of the Babylonian seed drill. Egyptians planted large seeds such as corn by laying them on the ground in front of the plow. These were then pushed under by the plow as it cut a furrow for the next row of seeds. So it doesn't uh, this is not how you plant wheat. You don't need the uh, animals. You don't need to uh, plant it deep, spread out with your hand. The, seed, the seeds are different. So, you know, this automatically tells you this is not wheat. They are depicting here of planting. And uh, thank you, Susan, for the donations. An early method of planting wheat involved using hand choppers to cultivate the soil. Then a farmer scattered seeds on the ground, throwing handfuls of seeds across the ground was called the broadcast method of sowing. Finally, goats were driven across the field to drive in the seeds. In this Egyptian mural, a farmer scatters seeds after the field has been plowed. Next, a team of goats would be driven across the field to drive in the seeds. The broadcast method of planting resulted in a thick stand of short wheat plants. We see more evidence that Egyptians were farming maize by the nature of the granaries that are often portrayed in the tomb murals. In this example, the granary has a corn crib and a stack of corn cobs that are still in the husk. Seed corn was typically stored while still in the husk. Egyptian women are shown in murals carrying seed bags and scattering seeds with their right hands. This suggests that the Assyrian genies, who also hold seed bags, have corn pods in their right hands. There are numerous Egyptian examples of effigies that have corn plants growing out of the body of the god Osiris. These plants are called Osiris beds and they play a role in the mortuary practices dealing with resurrection. So there is a relationship between Indian corn or maize and the Egyptian belief in resurrection. M.D.W. Jeffries mentioned evidence of maize in Nigeria by the 11th century. Carl Johannesson, Ann Parker, and Juid Ashraf have documented the existence of maize in India by the 12th century. It was not So these Hindu statues holding maize uh, ears, corn on their hands. Again, they try to tell us it was acorns and this all the stuff, this metaphors for the pineal gland. Maybe both realities, but it's literally corn they're holding. They brought corn, they helped them get civilized. The plant of the gods, the gods from where? From ancient, uh, from over there, uh, what they're calling, um, you know, in India, Peru means the east. Did you guys know Peru means the east? Peru means east in ancient India. Yeah, from Peru, the east, coming from America. Known by such names as Makarama, Kundrus, Junhari, and Hanta. I have documented several examples of maize in China, going back to the first century. Use of oxen to plow rows of maize is a characteristic of cornrow planting and not millet which is typically planted like a grass by sowing in the broadcast fashion. The evidence we have seen in the British Isles, Egypt, Nigeria, India, and China all indicate that the ancient travelers had spread maize agriculture all across the world prior to Columbus. In my old hometown of Chicago, there is a World's Fair in 1893. It was called the Columbian Exposition. The purpose of the fair was to celebrate America's rise to the status of a world power. The theme of the fair was the Columbus Voyage of 1492. A huge Venetian-style theme park was built up on 60 acres of marshland south of the city. Reporters dubbed this extravagant movie set the Great White City. With very few rare exceptions, they were also entirely fakes. The glorious structures looked like carved marble on the outside. However, they consisted of wood and steel frames. That had been covered over with cement and paper mache. They didn't last more than a few years after the fair had ended. Columbus was picked as a champion of the fair because historians were promoting the idea that he was picked by God to pave the way for the commercial development of the American wilderness. The premier slogan of the era was Manifest Destiny. And Columbus 
So my fault, I was muted. Uh, much love and respect, crazy there. Yeah, definitely those world fairs weren't built by uh, just wood and frames and, you know, uh, we've already, you know, come on. Um, <laughs> they'll tell you that, you know, but a lot of these buildings were kind of already here, you know. Um, they destroyed a lot of it. You can see that stone when they're destroying it, like it's just like look like a lot of debris, it's not just wood. Columbus was regarded as the embodiment of that slogan. Spain sent three replicas of the Columbus ships across the Atlantic to participate in the festivities. The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria drew crowds of visitors who wanted to share in the thrill of discovering new lands. Norwegians sent a replica of a Viking ship claiming that Leif Erikson had been to America almost 500 years before Columbus. However, historians denounced the Norwegians as ethnocentric spoilers who were trying to steal the credit that belonged to God's chosen hero, that is, to Columbus. Hmm. The scientific basis for the Columbus hoopla was based on the research and writing of a highly respected Swiss botanist by the name of Alphonse de Candolle. He published a book called The Origin of Cultivated Plants in 1886 and again in 1890, right before the, the Columbian Exposition. This book praised Columbus for bringing all the important old world plants to the Americas in 1492. So that's why they had to have all these books written so they can give this hijack, this false history to the people in the world fairs you guys hear what is going on here that's what i'm interpreting so I, that's what i picture anyways in these world fairs they're like they're teaching these uh people this fake history and stuff and uh they got these people dressed up and and all that uh these are your indians and these are your philippines and these are your negritos and these are your so and then you know but anyways columbus again you know that's the whole story that we debunked in my corn series that was the main point i just wanted to show that uh, in my first part one, that, you know, corn was in the ancient world and it wasn't because of Columbus, so-called uh, Columbus, Salvador Fernandez Sarco, Portuguese Jew, Sephardic Jew, so swarthy. Yeah, very swarthy, man. Let's go. And it also gave the Genovese navigator credit for bringing all the New World plants <clears throat> back to Spain in 1493. From this point onward, said Nicando, all the vital crop plants spread around the world. Supposedly, the most important plant that Columbus brought across the seas was maize. De Cando paid lip service to the notion that scientists should do adequate research in the field in order to test the validity of their theories. He reasoned that if anybody had beat Columbus in crossing the seas, it would have been the Egyptians. Americans? Ancient he Americans? He further surmised that if the Egyptians had brought back maize, they would have included maize plants in all of their tombs and temples. And so he made a trip to Cairo and he saw nothing that looked to him like maize. Uh, and it's no wonder he saw murals if, that had maize if he looked at this one from the Ptolemaic era. Uh, the plants were probably intended to represent the magical corn of Osiris, but admittedly, they don't look anything at all like maize plants. The Columbian Exposition solidified the power of the doctrinaire academics who believed that the Americas were isolated from the old world contact until after Columbus. Hmm. I didn't realize that this Colombian exposition was literally for him and how they literally indoctrinating people in this Colombian exposition. Listen to what he's saying. About 26 million people attended the fair and they witnessed the first major display of electric light in the Ferris wheel. Thus, the heroic image of Columbus as a divinely chosen discoverer was welded to advances in technology. In the late 1880s, textbooks portrayed Columbus as God's champion, basking in holy light. Most American historians praised Columbus as God's chosen instrument for starting the American nation, proving that the earth was round and for introducing Burma shave and billboards all across the American Corn Belt from Indiana to Nebraska. Textbooks frequently began the American history story with Columbus, even though the Spanish admiral never set foot on any mainland that later became the United States. Nope. Many of the illustrations showed Columbus with a map in hand as he directed his crew on the first historic voyage in 1492. His Moorish Sephardic crew. Here's a copy of one of the maps that was available to Columbus. It actually still hangs on a wall in the library of his hometown of Genoa. This version was uh, painted on vellum in 1457. Here's a schematic of the Genoese planisphere. It shows a coastline at the arrow that looks very much like the east coast of the Americas. All right, so you guys see where it says Cate, that's North America. And down here, that's South America. And then he got India over here, you see? So what's this over here? <laughs> Look at the Gulf of Mexico. All right. 
in the islands. You go up here, you got New Newfoundland coming up here, Hudson Bay. All right. Are you guys got your third eye open? In 1992, the Orthodox American historians had yet another excuse to propagandize their hero and their defunct paradigm of New World cultural isolation. This was the 500th anniversary of the Columbus voyage. The focal point of the festivities was a special exhibit that was mounted at the Smithsonian Institution, seen here in Washington, D.C. The Smithsonian exhibit was called Seeds of Chains, and once more, Columbus was praised for bringing the first maze from the New World back to Spain in 1493. Smithsonian. So you guys see the Smithsonian, and then now Columbus brought it. They see how they just changed all history and erased ancient world, America, its contributions to the world. Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, there are many monuments that have been left by futuristic thinkers. The purpose of these monuments is to help people make a mental leap into thinking about the future based on science and the world community, and not upon the doomsday philosophy of fundamentalist prophets. The guiding eye and the pyramid uh -oh. on the back of the nation's seal and uh -oh. on money in everyone's pocket or billfold uh -oh. is supposed to be a reminder of the lofty ideals upon which the nation was ordained. <laughs> the motto, Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new world order uh -oh. is ordained, is supposed to remind us that the American government is not built up on the old model of a tyrant dictating from the top, but instead it is built up from the bottom by the people, for the people, and for an eternity into the future. Uh oh, whoa, that was, <laughs> he just, uh, I guess he's a traveling man. That's all I got to say. Is the past the key to the future? Well, I think it can be. When I was a graduate student in anthropology at the University of Wisconsin, my major professor had above his doorway a big banner that said, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. Okay. It was a quote from the philosopher George Santayana, and the presumption was that if we remember what happened in the past, if we teach our history, and if we learn our history, Listen. we won't be... Con we won't be making the same mistakes over and over again yep. because we'll know better. Yep. And, and so when I was a graduate student in anthropology, I looked around me and it seemed to me that we were, as a society, making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Yep. So I went up to my major professor and I said, well, George Santayana had a point that we should know what happened in the past. But the question I asked him was this, but what if the past that we remember is wrong then our only yep. way out of this predicament is to fix the history yes and the history that is currently being taught in the schools. listen the history that says among other things that columbus brought the first corn or indian corn across the atlantic ocean is totally wrong totally wrong and historians have been teaching this in school for over a century which suggests to me that the historians and the anthropologists have been essentially out to lunch for that period of time. So you guys understand, like, when I did the little short video, a lot of people were like, so what's the point? Like, I don't get what you're, what's the point of the short? Um, you guys, you know, it's a 13th century, meaning it's a, it's a temple from the 1200s in India with t Hindu deities holding corn. Yet, the scholars in India will say that Columbus and the Portuguese brought corn over there. But then they're saying that's corn they're holding. At the same time, they're contradicting themselves. You guys understand it's deep. It's deep. And what he just said is, is deep. Why? You no, know, because he's on the inside looking out. He's trying to help wake y'all up before he was gone. And, you know, so that's why I gave him respect for spilling the beans. <laughs> All right. I think that conferences like this on the Internet can be a step in the right direction. It is. We're doing it, Gunner. We're doing it. What you said can be a... This is He's talking about this is before the internet was popular. We're doing it, Gunner. I'd like to thank Steve St. Clair, the St. Clair family, Wayne May, Ancient American Magazine. Uh, shout out to Wayne May. I actually called the, the, the company to order some magazines. He answered and he's like, hey, he's helped me order some magazines. Shout out to Wayne. With the ancient american magazines i got a lot we've read all over 
a lot of great articles uh, in those magazines. I share a lot of them in my Patreon, and I'm going to also share this documentary there in my Patreon. Rick Osmond, the Oopaloopa Cafe, and Blog Talk Radio for making this conference possible. I'd also like to invite you to stick with us for the oncoming programs. There's a lot of new discoveries that we're going to be seeing today. And from these new discoveries, hopefully, we'll have new keys to the future. Thank you for being with us. I'm Gunnar Thompson. Man, I was muted. I'm not going to repeat, but a uh, good thing I, I caught right now. I was, yeah, I, was, I didn't even know I was muted. Sorry, guys, because I, I got people coming in the room, so I, I mute sometimes. So this is ancient corn from Peru, all right? Ancient cobs, corn, as you guys see in the bottom, and tomb, from a tomb on Peru. Very ancient. We're talking about B.C., like, we're talking about four or 5,000 years old, guys. Four or 5,000 years old, they already, they already had domesticated corn and grown it abundantly. It takes time to get to that state of civilization where you're already growing corn, you got temples, you got sports games, you got all this kind of stuff. You're growing cotton. In Caral Supe, you're growing cotton massively and exporting it all over the world. Cotton. Check out my Caral Supe documentary. It's deep. Gonna have some more videos on Peru. It gets deep what they're finding there. These temples, very old. Very old looking, very ancient. So again, this is Peru, uh, sorry, corn, maize, ancient. Again, looking like acorn, what they tell them, they told us all life, oh, they're holding acorn. No, this is this is what they're holding. All right. So uh, thanks for uh, tuning in, uh, guys. Appreciate you. Let me, uh, uh, you know, I just wanted to go ahead and upload this uh, documentary fully so you guys can watch the whole thing. A lot of people were asking me where I got that clip. So there you go. Shout out to uh, Viso Breeze for the uh, uh, beats. <laughs> Let me see. But I'm going to go back to Joseph Levels. All right. Joseph Levels. He got another song. The one we came in with was called We Are the a Advanced Ancient Alien Race. That was the introduction in intro. You get it? Because they say, oh, the pyramids were built by aliens. Yeah. 
we're aliens. <laughs> we are the advanced ancient alien race. And now we're going to leave with calling on our ancestors from the spirit realm. That's the name of the song. All right. Shout out to Joseph Levels. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning in, everybody. Uh, it was fun. I'm going to be uploading a lot of little shorts here while I'm working on other uh, longer videos, you know, other investigations. I'm actually translating a whole book in Spanish right now. You know, I have to do it manually because I can't copy paste the book and I can't download it. And it's only in Spanish and we need to read this book. And uh, this investigation by this anthropologist uh, from Mexico regarding the so-called Olmex. All right, so Pura Vida, mi gente. Thanks for tuning in. Much love and respect. Wow, wow, wow.
blessings and protection. May Hawa bless and protect you. Be strong. Be ready. <laughs>